Okay, so now we're going to have a panel on uh, flexible data placement. And with that, uh, we have lots of people here, and I'm sure after they talk, you're going to have questions. So let me start with introducing people. So let's see, we have Dave Landsman here. Dave is, uh, manages st story standards across Western Digital. He's active in standards since 2008, representing SanDIS, then Western Digital. He has contributions to NVMe, PCI SIG, JDEX, SATIO, T10, T13, SNEA, SFF. He's a board member for NVMe and SNEA and DNA storage. And uh, he has a BA in computer science from University of California, San Diego. And Dave, I'll let you wave and tell people who you are. And then when, let's see, we got Dan over here next. He's a senior architect at uh, Samsung, focusing on future generations of MVME SSDs. Dan attended Carnegie Mellon uh, University for control systems and HDDs. And he has over 30 patents. And he continues to engage in architectural reviews of standard features in MVME and other interfaces while he prepares for their integration to Samsung's market-leading SSDs. Then let's see, next here, let's go to John. Uh, John is a senior SSD architect at Solidine. John's been working on flash memory since 2000. John's been part of multiple flash industry transitions, the transition from NOR to NAND, transition to multiple bits per cell, 3D NAND, has been focused on SSD placement modes, where he's worked for, with multiple industry participants involved in these with MU Express. Uh, we have David Wang there on the end, who's generously decided to join us today. He's a technical director at Silicon Motion, responsible for firmware architecture, design of enterprise SSDs. And prior to that, he worked with PMC Sierra, Micro Semi, Microchip for 15 years. He led the high-performance firmware development for SAS uh, MVME PCIe SSD storage chips, such as SAS expanders, PCI storage switches, SAS HPA controllers, and he has an MS in electronic engineering. Uh, then uh, Chris is here for questions after these other speakers talk. Chris is a SSD architect at Google and an uh, excellent resource on this topic. So with that, how about if we kick it off here, and uh, Dave, I think you're up first here. All right, thank you. Let's see. Okay. Got myself set. Okay, so can you hear me? Good. So uh, thanks for the intro, Ross. Um, so I, uh, since I'm, in, I've been involved in standards many years, uh, other things before that, but I wanted to give a little bit of a perspective on. Uh, how FTP fits into the wider standards ecosystem and some of the implications of that uh, for, for, for all of us. So if we look at the data placement discussions in NVMe, Chris already referred to the fact that they, these discussions really go back farther than this, but in, in the context of NVMe, um, we started talking about data placement pretty seriously around 2015. And the first effort was uh, streams. And this was a pretty simple and elegant way of just the host would give a, uh, a, a, a hint or an ID to the drive. And the drive would say, I'll place the data uh, optimally so that when I have to uh, delete it later, I reduce, you know, I, I, I don't fragment the drive. So that, that this, you know, it was a, a first step. Some people implemented it. Um, but it didn't have many control knobs and whistles. And then, so, um, uh, knobs and dials. So, meantime, uh, there was a debate going on in a community called Open Channel, which I, I'm sure all of you know about. And the Open Channel, um, well, I'm not even doing my, so the Open Channel uh, uh, community said, let's take a completely new look at the SSD. Let's, let's get rid of the FTL inside the SSD. And the host will control everything, down to dies, channels, et cetera, and also the media. And this, this gives the host ultimate control, uh, host code, but it also presents some challenges in terms of being uh, exposed to 
the, the vagaries of NAND media, um, not only across vendors, but within vendors from, from generation to generation of NAND. So this is very, it was a very healthy debate. It's still going on, kind of, in some ways. Um, so the next, the next place where placement got uh, talked about, uh, what we came back to NVMe and um, Amazon and um, Facebook, then Facebook, now Meta, um, brought a, a, a proposal called IO determinism to NVMe. And this, this was really not f focused so much on placement or on reducing uh, write amp, but it was, and, and it wasn't so focused on placement, sorry, but it, um, it brought new structures, data structures in NVMe that allowed uh, the host and the device to cooperate on the usage of resources, in, primary, uh, in particular endurance groups. So endurance groups allowed you the device, to, the host to tell the device where to well, where level. So I'll where level this portion of the drive, this way, you know, here, and then so I'll divide. It, it was an IO isolation mechanism. So um, meanwhile, uh, back, so this got standardized in NVMe. Um, whoop, uh, meanwhile, back in the open channel debates, uh, Microsoft kicked off uh, the Denali initiative, and there were, you know, many of the companies in NVMe and in, uh, others around the industry got together, and there were really two things that we ended up discussing in Denali. There was a continuation, there was an attempt to standardize uh, 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 open channel, and because prior to this, uh, hyperscale vendors had started doing their own versions of open channel, and it, so there was an attempt to coalesce open channel and do a more formal standard. And then also, um, the, there was another uh, initiative called Append Only Streams, which was kind of carrying on in the streams, uh, the streams legacy, or the streams uh, focus. And, but it was a stream that carried more state. So you could, you could, there were more hints about the topology of the device and, and also how to open and close them and things like that. So it was kind of moving along the spectrum of more control for the host, but not as much as open channel. So um, the next thing that happened was around 20, uh, at the end of 2018, the folks on the Denali uh, initiative decided we really want to try and move this into NVMe. And so this resulted in the standardization of two major proposals in NVMe, endurance groups and um, zone namespaces. So endurance groups, endurance group management carried on the tradition of, of, of managing, uh, exposing topology. It added, it added the notion of media units or uh, parallel units. Um, and so it, it created a framework for managing the resources in a drive more explicitly if that's what you wanted to do. Um, zone namespaces, um, I, I kind of, it, it took a different, it uh, went along in the streams kind of uh, focus and it introduced a sequential only append write model for the host and it borrowed uh, another aspect of it is that it, it borrowed the basic host management model from SMR HDDs, which already had its own um, set of standards for, for controlling uh, zones. So we kind of integrated, with ZNS, we kind of tried to integrate uh, SSDs to some extent into, uh, into the zone, uh, zone storage ecosystem that was pre-existing, ironically, for hard drives. So um, the next thing that happened and uh, maybe I'll short, shorten, shorten this a little bit because Chris just talked about it, um, is we had the data, the direct uh, placement discussions and then the smart FTL, you know, Google had been working on smart FTL for years actually and they just, you know, they just decided to standardize it pretty recently and then the two, Google and Meta uh, joined together. And so, um, so why am I telling this story? The, the, the reason is we, We've left a lot of standards on the cutting room floor, really, if you look at this picture. Uh, there's a lot of work. It was good work. Uh, we all, you know, we're kind of meandering our way. We're, we had a common goal, which is to reduce write amp and thereby reducing garbage collection in the devices and, you know, so, so that we end up with more endurance and better throughput and more predictable latency. So, but we kind of wandered through our, uh, this journey. So now we have two that are pretty, Pretty, you know, ZNS is starting to get established and FTP is well on its way to being standardized. 
So, um, and I think they, these two actually, they had they, they share common goals in terms of reducing writing up, but the way they're, and they, they there is no absolute, you can, they, they have their own lanes in terms of how people are using them, kind of their own segments, and this is the point I wanted to make. So the, the typical FDP, I'll say typical, um, I don't know if there's a typical yet, but uh, well, uh, yeah. the, the FDP emphasis is really on you know, compute -centric, a compute-centric drive that's a standard drive, um, which, could, which could be used for a standard random workload, but if, if one imp imp runs in FDP, one can, uh, you know, can optimize the, the, the garbage collection and the overhead on the drive so that you get more efficient, as, as Mike, and, uh, 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 Mike was explaining. And the, the zone storage model is kind of capacity and cost saving centric. So there's, there's a desire to get the maximum capacity out of the drive, which leads people to want to use QLC, which is more sensitive, it's slower, and, and it's more sensitive to endurance, or it has lower endurance. So um, this means that people are willing to optimize their storage stacks to, to take advantage, to write sequentially to the storage stack, and uh, write sequentially to the storage. And, and, and optimize these. So we, we and the, the protocol between the, two, um, between the two solutions kind of reflects those aspects. So FTP, the host writes to any LBA in any order. Um, whereas in ZNS, the host writes to a pen point, uh, in a pen point of the zone. Uh, in, for FTP, the host guides placement with hints and, and thereby minimizes um, uh, device garbage collection. And in ZNS, the zones uh, are managed in the host, and, um, and the, the fact that you're writing sequentially to, to the zones kind of just minimizes or, or eliminates the avoidance, uh, uh, eliminates garbage collection. At least that's, that's the theory. So anyway, um, my, my real point is, uh, like I said, we've left a lot of standards on the cutting room floor and collectively done a lot of work. And I think we're emerging out, out the back here with two, two solutions that are pretty, that kind of have their own lanes in terms of use cases. And I'd really like the community to try and build these two out, stabilize them, and we'll, we'll see what happens happens, right? It, it, when we'll end up with one or two or both, but um, the ecosystem needs stability, and drive vendors need stability. We need, we need big segments of the market to pour SKUs into, so that our customers can, can, um, yeah, and so the customers can have good solutions that implement both of these. We can't be the fragmentation is starting to be hurtful. So let's let's all try and uh, go on from here. So, sorry if I went too long, but that's what I have. Thank you, Dave. Let's uh, continue here. Okay, Dan, take it away. Thank you. So I just wanted to call out a few. I think we've had a, a bunch of explanations on how the standards work, and I wanted to call attention to a few of the design decisions that are left to drive vendors. So one of the major things that wasn't emphasized really in an earlier discussion is that when we lay out RGs and how we lay them out, we might possibly set one entire full reclaim group, or alternatively, we can also have one reclaim group per die. And these are two choices, just showing the spectrum of choices that are there available for drive vendors to work with their customers and try and see what works best in their configurations. And of course, this is the most extreme side of both sides, but of course, if there were some need we could talk about reclaim groups across channels or down channels. So these are some of the, the versatility that remains in a lot of decisions, right? Just because something's standardized, to Dave's point, doesn't mean that we have a full common use case that's fully set in stone. We have a lot of uh, building blocks that can be pulled a lot of different directions. And I didn't add the image for this, but RU formation and how they are formed inside of the RGs can be another decision that, that is available there to be worked within the standard and isn't limited. 
I think we've focused on uh, super blocks, but as we can see with the RG zero, uh, or, or the RG per die, we might need, we can't do a full uh, super block there. We might have one erase block or one erase block per plane. So while we have this versatility on how we lay out our NAND and how we present it to our, our customers, we also have an efficient controller resourcing uh, for addressing and having the RUH reporting, and we have new capabilities to, in, in, in enterprise, we generally assume that everything is already power fail protected. FDP is starting to add back in that maybe some of these uh, FDP configurations want to be uh, power safe, but then there's others that maybe don't quite have enough capacitors or uh, board area for some of these capabilities. So here's one that FDP is already standardized that we might be reporting some of the configurations uh, have a risk of data loss on power fail. An advantage that happens with uh, data when we receive a write, if there were an error and a media uh, problem on a write, as a drive, we want to make sure that we're taking that data and writing it. So there is, within FDP, an ability to reroute around media errors. And when we compare and contrast that to the endurance groups that Dave was bringing up, we're expected, if we were to fail on a write in an endurance group, then we wouldn't have another place to put that write data. And we would actually need to report a failure to the drive. But here, FDP, the drive takes the error, and it continues to write the data. And later, in the background, the host is able to find that there was an error and able to work with the drive. And, and the incoming data isn't lost. The data center can continue functioning. As Mike has emphasized already, there's already an ability to work for legacy users so that they don't need to necessarily be aware as a, as a host user. And there is a lot of uh, ability within FDP to build further and extended features. I don't think that the standards are done and finished today. I think they'll continue to develop and optimize. And I think that major thing to highlight before I hand it off to the next is that we, we see an ability, especially with the RG, RU formations, a real uh, possibility where maybe we have for one customer two different SKUs or perhaps the better word to say it is two FDP configurations where one drive is used in two different ways in two different use cases or more. So with that, I think I'll, I'll pass it on and I'll let others uh, do their introduction slides. Thank you. Let's continue here on our adventure. John, you are up here. Thank you. So the, the headline of this talk is Implementer's Perspective on FDP. And uh, I wanted to spend some time talking about it from our point of view. Uh, we've been working on placement mode since 2015. As, as Dave had mentioned, this has been around for quite a while. We've learned quite a bit from the customers that we've interacted with. And one of the things that we've learned uh, is I can talk about what we do inside the drive from, uh, from the implementation perspective, but really it's driven mostly by a partnership between us as the vendor building the drives and you guys as the systems using those drives. So this partnership really uh, comes down to the fact that these drives are different. They don't operate the same way as the regular block-based NVMe drives work. And you know, giving that capability uh, to the host system and allowing the host to drive the right application to one, as Chris you know, very, did a very nice job talking about in his presentation, really depends on the host side doing stuff in an optimal fashion to, to leverage these drives. And some of the considerations that the host has to think about with this new methodology of how TP4 4146 works is, uh, you know, they've got res they're responsible for uh, scheduling uh, on the host system, and, and when you have direct access to the NAND die, if you schedule I/O uh, using the placement IDs in TP4 to 46, and you know you drive all those I/Os to say one NAND die, you're going to get bad performance. So really, the host has to understand the geometry, take on this capability, take on this ability to drive some of the scheduling that a normal block-based NVMe drive previously had taken care of. In addition to that. Because the NAND is being directly uh, 
accessible and consumable by the host system, they really need to be aware of the constraints on the architecture uh, of the NAND device and understand how developing their system side software that's leveraging, uh, leveraging that drive can rely on those uh, characteristics of the NAND. And we may add features and benefits to NAND devices uh, over time that some of them may have absolutely no value to TP4 and 46. Other attributes may be con entirely uh, leverageable by TP4 and 46. And as I mentioned, it's really incumbent on the host to understand the geometry of the drive so they can drive IO and, and leverage that capability. That was you know, basically opaque behind the previous NVMe block-based interface. Garbage collection and housekeeping, host now doesn't have 100% of that responsibility, but has a lot of uh, capability to drive optimal use of uh, garbage collection housekeeping inside the drive. And basically TP4146 now has some, some new uh, commands that are there that weren't, weren't there before that the host system would now have to deal with. So from a host perspective, you know, I, I, we have uh, customers coming to us and saying, hey, I want to use ZNS or hey, I want to use TP4146 and the, it's the first time they had thought about it. And you know, I have a series of presentations that I go through with new customers that kind of walk them through, okay, uh, if you go ZNS, this is what you're gonna take on as a host system. Are you capable to do that? And it's really eye-opening because some vendors or some of our customers come to us and it's the first time they had heard any of this. Other vendors have gone through the SMR HDD infrastructure and already have a ZNS infrastructure built out and it's like, okay, great, here's a ZNS drive, you can take that directly. Um, but really, and, and even with TP4 and 46, with the default ID, uh, you can use the drive with some of the legacy infrastructure, but to fully consume the drive in an optimal fashion, it's really the host has to take on, take on some of this burden. And that's by design, right? Um, the host system is the part of the system that understands that the best uh, and can, can take care of that. So I'm not gonna go through the system benefits part that I've got down there because I think, you know, Chris talked through that very well in his presentation. It's all about getting the, getting the optimal usage out of the drive and getting the performance as close to 100% of the capability, not having a bunch of performance being consumed in the background on the drive that has no benefit to the host system. Those are, those are the things that, uh, that we're trying to do. And that comes from you know, the picture that I show on the bottom right hand side. By having the ability to place data in the drive, you get all the benefits uh, that I'm talking about on the lower left side. Now getting to the point of what this talk was actually about is you know, the industry, our, uh, our considerations on what we do as is, is being a vendor of placement modes is, you know, there are TP4 and M46, and I think you know, Dan mentioned this also, there's different configurations that we would uh, advertise as capability in the drive. I can go crazy with those configurations and I can make a thousand different configurations for, but there's a, there's a cost to each one of those configurations and validation. So really what I think we wanna do as an industry, and this is where this partnership word uh, makes sense again, is I wanna drive those configurations down to as small of a subset of configurations as possible uh, to basically cover most of the use cases and allow us to have a simplified validation because that makes it cheaper for us, allows us to get drives out faster to the industry and, and really, you know, we don't find corner cases if there's a bunch of people using those same, uh, those same configurations. And then another big consideration for us is the default PID. Uh, you know, I, in a TP4 to M46 system, I wouldn't expect the drive to be 99% using the default PID and 1% using placement mode. I'd like that ratio to be more in the other direction. But there is a balance that I have to do on how complex do I implement the default placement ID. Do I steer everything to one, one PID? Do I steer everything, do I, do I allow for more percentage of that drive to be consumed with the placement, default placement ID? Uh, you know, and those are some of the things that hopefully standardizing on a couple configurations would allow us to get good answers for. Um, some of the other stuff I've got here is, you know, as I talked about on the other part of the slides, there's some future NAND features that we may build out. And, you know, there may be some things that happen in NAND uh, going forward, looking out five to 10 years that may be divergent from some of the stuff that we're trying to do. You know, performance for NAND, 
could fall off a cliff. You know, there could be many different things that could happen in the future. Um, and then one of the other things to consider is TP4146, if you go to a really large capacity drive, you may have to uh, use a larger indirection, set, indirection unit to save on DRAM, but, but that's something that we would build into, a, into one, of the, one of the configurations that we would support. So that's basically uh, it for our part. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, David, your turn. Hello. Um, <coughs> IFTB has so many benefits. So we already see we um, we are toward the world is um, uh, WAP uh, right application equals one. But um, but at the same time, this um, uh, create some uh, challenge in the um, SSD controller design. So um, in, in this topic, uh, I will um, spend a few minutes to talk about the um, uh, FTP implementation uh, difficulty and uh, our proposal or, or some uh, consideration to uh, tackle this issue. Um, <coughs> so first, the uh, FTP, FTP application usually require a big number of open blocks, uh, which imply SD controller provide a large size of um, high bandwidth write buffer. So as we know, it's a um, typical application, maybe need a 8, 16, 32, or maybe 64 um, open blocks or, 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 or write a handle, uh, write a uh, reclaim unit handle. Uh, you know, in the SSD implementation, we need to reserve the dedicated write resource for each open blocks. So this is a big number of resource. And uh, another thing is um, <coughs> because um, with so many open blocks, we uh, just uh, cause some, um, we can see lots of um, open, open blocks in the same die. So we also need to reserve some buffer for, for the right, for the can, uh, right, right conclusion or write a erase uh, co uh, collision. Um, <coughs> usually um, use the internal RAM as a write buffer um, is a very efficiency, but uh, now we need to support so many open blocks, we need to consider to use DRAM. But uh, when you use the DRAM, we have the two challenges. The one is um, DRAM bandwidth. Another, is, uh, another thing is um, super cap, because we need a super cap to protect the right buffer. Next, yes. <coughs> so in the, um, our, our design consideration in the Gen 5 NVMe controller, so, so NVMe controller uh, may support the high bandwidth DDR5 DRAM that can Especially if we support the dual channel, we basically we can remove the DRAM um, performance limit. So this can help. The second point is um, maybe we need we our write flow, IO handle flow. Maybe we need to consider the flexible write write and cache mechanism to. Um, to support the configurable open block number. Here, uh, there's a table for the two cases. One is uh, some uh, small um, or medium number open block number. So we can, we can still has, uh, use some internal RAM for the data operation, ma manipulation, or, and the name program buffer. Uh, yeah, for when the Open block number is uh, about 32. Um, usually, we need to consider use a DRAM as um, as a program buffer, but we still need to use an internal RAM as um, data manipulation and uh, or parity buffer or something. So in this case, DRAM um, because we DRAM buffer lots of write buffer, program buffer, program data. So we need to consider the super cap 
because the super kept the um, SSD form factor the usually limit limited the super cap capacitor. So this also affect how many open how many data we can save during power loss. So so we need to um, carefully calculate how many open blocks we need to support we can support. Okay, um, we I didn't go go to the detail of what the what the um, data flow. So yeah, I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much. So now it's time for Q&A. We have a mic over here. We have a mic over here. And who would like to be the first one to ask our speakers a question about this? I'll ask a question. Okay, can you go to the, can you go to the mic? Um, can, can you guys talk about your plans for contributing to open source and timing and because I get a lot of questions from that, from people that we're talking to. Uh, Chris, do you want to start, or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, I think we we um, we have a you know working on a, a a library internally to sort of extract some of this fan management stuff, and we do do hope to open source it at some point. So okay. I don't think there's a specific committed time frame for okay. that, but that is, that is one of our desires to, to to move forward on that front. I think. Um, I don't know, Ross. Uh, I, I can also say uh, I am aware that Linux is working on support, and that is coming in the near future. Okay. With Thank that, you. Um, questions from the mics. So, uh, just to expand on that same question, where do you see the rest of the OS is adopting this? Do you see that happening in Windows, VMware? Do, do we see this only being a Linux thing? I think that I think that's a question to be determined in the future. You know, adoption starts slowly and grows with time. But I, uh, yeah, I, I will say that you know, FTP does have a lot of backwards compatibility with default, um, um, you know, fill points or you know, uh, RUH handles per per namespace, and so um, you ca you can do kind of namespace level isolation probably um, in pretty much any OS, but just you know. NVMe CLI and configuring things the right way once we get the extensions in there, so. Yes. Sir, go I ahead. I missed this in Michael's presentation. It, does the host issue a deallocate or a trim to the reclaim unit? Is that, how does garbage collection happen with FTP? Um, so, so the, yeah, I think Mike was kind of alluding to it. So LBAs in FTP, LBAs and where data is placed on flash are orthogonal, right? So, you know, the write comes in with an LBA and a, uh, a handle or an index, and um, and those those sort of impact different parts of the logic, right? So so no matter you know the the the, the DRAM generally the DRAM mapping table that, that maps the physical location, um, and that that is just tagged based on the LBA and the write, and the you know the placement is controlled separately. So. Um, so yeah, so the way you clean up as an application is you just do a standard deallocate on an LBA's list or range or whatever, and those that's how you free up. Um, and it doesn't really matter. Like if I'm, I could write large sequential blocks and then do a large sequential trim and, and know that I freed up a big chunk of an RU or multiple RUs, or I could actually write kind of random LBAs, but know that they're all going to the same uh, R, you know, RU, and if I have the structures to keep track of that and trim all that big long list know that I've freed up an entire RU, right? So it's it's kind of up to the host to um, state it another way, you can kind of imagine a standard stock file system with however it's doing block management, LBA management, LBA allocation, running on top of an FTP drive, as long as you can add this hint of what you wanna, you know, which index you wanna use, which which handle as sort of just just pass through those layers. An application sitting on top of it can still get the benefits of, of isolation through that. So, and in terms of log on log right amp, that's how you would do it. Though, is you just the host to avoid log on log would just issue a, a trim and deallocate to that. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's that's our. Sorry, the last question is if the good thing about putting all this data together on the same reclaim unit is, I guess, the temporal locality, but that's also the bad thing. So in terms of refresh, if I have a particular data set that's sitting there for a really, really long time, 
I'm assuming it's the device's responsibility to go in and refresh that. The host doesn't have to worry about it. Yeah, so one of the main uh, uh, design perspectives is the erase blocks or whatever the placement IDs are pointing to is logical in the drive, so the NAND media is managed by the drive. So we take full responsibility for making sure that they, the integrity of that data. Yes, we got another question over here. Yes. Um, so today there are a significant number of storage engines that use a sequential pattern, essentially. They, they use some sort of log structure. And to reduce write amplification for hard drive to avoid sick times. Um, so that makes a, a, a very good fit, seems, for ZNS. So those uh, storage engines will do their own garbage collection. They call it compaction. So it's a good fit for ZNS. What FTP will um, offer to this type of workloads on top of what ZNS can do for them? You, you, want to, you can take this. Yeah, I think I think the big things are there. There are a lot of there are some that, that that already have that you know capability. There's a lot that don't, and FTP is a much more kind of um, approachable incremental change in a lot of cases. You don't have to rip apart your entire infrastructure. I think the other one is. Um, Getting back to Dave's point about you know kind of local use cases, there's a lot of uh, benefit in terms of isolation and virtualization, right? Where it does have to be standard NVMe command set. You don't have control over maybe a guest OS that has that knows you can't dictate which file system or anything, but you still want maybe want some level of isolation capability, and so um, that's another major uh, benefit uh, here. And Ross, I think, has some additional points. Sure, maybe. I can add on to this. So a couple details. So FTP is targeted at taking standard devices and making them work better. You can turn it on and off. It's not a su some other type of device that's targeted for. Th with that, um, it does enable you to place the data, know where it is, and erase the data. And whether you can do sequential, you can do random, and it's all about controlling the placement and reducing your WAF. And so it provides a lot of flexibility in your systems for how you deploy devices. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, so um, I mean, great panel, great presentation. So I agree with the statement to define configurations, you know, to especially for the implementers in terms of reducing the complexity to get it implemented, to validate it. So what are the next steps to define these configurations? Is there projects being planned here within OCP? I, I think that's a great topic of discussion within OCP. Uh, obviously for next steps, you know, this needs to be ratified. Um, and, but I think that is a discussion, especially uh, among people who uh, buy devices of what do they think are reasonable configurations and what do they want? And trying to align, you know, very similar to, you know, there's the OCP data center SSD spec, and that is the whole purpose of that spec, and I think that's a great forum to work on that. Yeah, agreed. Do we have more questions today? With that, if there are no more questions, uh, what time do we come back? Okay, so you can go to lunch, 12.30, we're gonna start up. So I encourage you to be here to see HDD Dynamics when you start up, and I wanna thank you all for uh, coming today, for being here this morning. <laughs> <laughs>